a key federal district court judge from the Northern District Court of Texas, who has a strong record of making pro-Second Amendment rulings, has unfortunately not come through. We're talking about Mock v. Garland, a case led by the Firearms Policy Coalition, a great pro to a group who unfortunately in this case has lost while moving for a preliminary injunction to stop the pistol brace rule from going into effect. Now, to be clear, the battle is far from over, both in this case as well as in the other pistol brace cases that are out there. But why does this loss particularly sting? And why are gun control advocates going to be using the fingerprints and breadcrumbs that we find in this case elsewhere? How does this tie into the larger picture in a pro Bruin world? Guys, my name is Tom Grieve. I'm a former state criminal prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Let's get into it. So there's all sorts of different issues that this judge got into responding to the plaintiff's motion for the preliminary injunction. And unless you want to see a two hour video, we're just not gonna have time to get into all of them. What I do want to get into are the ones that I find to be the most relevant. We're gonna work through those. Here we go. So the first one deals with the APA or the Administrative Procedurals Act. This has to do to the general fact of how laws get passed, interpreted, and enforced. So Congress or your local state legislature passes a law. They write a statute. But oftentimes the interpretation of that statute winds up getting delegated to a particular either federal or state agency. In this particular case, when we're talking about Second Amendment related statutes, written by Congress. It's up to the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, and ultimately the ATF to interpret those statutes. So a common issue that we're seeing coming out of these ATF ruling cases as a frontline issue for why the ATF should lose according to plaintiffs is look, the ATF is overstepping their mandated authority to interpret these rules. Because again, they're allowed to interpret within the statute, but they cannot interpret beyond the statute. This is one of the key reasons why the ATF lost the frame receiver rule from the same judge, by the way, that we're talking about in this case. However, that is not what happened here. This The APA was a frontline issue raised by the Firearms Policy Coalition and the plaintiffs. The judge just simply went the other way. The plaintiffs did not argue, according to the judge, that their devices are not short-barreled rifles within the meaning of the statute, only that the rule was wrong. Therefore, according to the judge, the plaintiffs failed to establish that it is the rule and not the statute that is the problem. And if you're getting confused, I'm gonna put this in English, okay? And as a result, the plaintiffs therefore failed to establish that the rule is the problem, not the statute. What does this all mean in English? Basically, the judge is going to the fact of, look, if pistol-braced rifles, again, according to the judge, not according to me, but according to the judge, if pistol-braced pistols <laughs> are actually uh, not rifles, according to a plain reading of the statute, but the ATF has transgressed that, then okay. The rule is the problem. But the judge is saying that the plaintiffs didn't do that. The judge is instead saying that, look, the plaintiffs are arguing to why the rule is the problem, not why the rule overstates the statute, why it goes beyond constructing the statute. Let me give you a quick example here. Again, just I, I like to do examples. What the judge is saying is, look, show me a case where one of these pistol brace rifles if you read the statute, doesn't meet the definition of the statute, but does meet the definition of being a short barrel rifle according to the rule. That's the issue here. The judge is saying that the FPC and the plaintiffs did not do that. They've only been attacking the rule, not showing how the rule has gone beyond the statute. Again, I'm not saying that that's my position. I'm simply explaining the ruling. If you want me to do videos about my position and kind of teasing this more apart, let me know in the comment field below. So from page 30 of the document that's attached below, document, not the actual case ruling, we have from the judge, quote, the rule on the other hand reaches the correct conclusion that a pistol equipped with a stabilizing brace can be a rifle and thus a short-barreled rifle within the meaning of the NFA and the Gun Control Act. In other words, the GCA. So we're talking about the National Firearms Act of 1934, the National Gun Control Act of 1968. They go on to say that what starts as a pistol cannot be turned into a rifle as part of this. So the FPC is saying, look, it starts as a pistol, cannot be turned into a rifle. And since it cannot be turned into a rifle, it cannot be turned into a short-barreled rifle. And this goes to some very arcane and obscure statutes, which again, if you want me to go into more, I'm going to try to keep it short here, about 
whether or not something is constructed as a pistol, is it always a pistol? Whether or not something's constructed as a rifle, is it always a rifle? Long story short, the court once more says no to this point and points to an early 90s U.S. Supreme Court case that I actually I did a video on not that long ago going into so-called uh, constructive intent as well as so-called possessive intent. Yes, if you do some Googling and some forms, you will have encountered that of basically when do parts that could be assembled into a lawful pistol, for instance, or into an illegal SBR without the license scene regime and so forth. When is that a crime when that isn't? And that largely comes from the case of Thompson Center, which again, we'll put that link in the description box below if you want to learn when parts become guns and when guns can turn into felonies. But the gist to it is the judge is once more saying that, well, quote, while a manufacturer's description of weapon may be relevant in determining whether it is designed, made, and intended to be fired from the shoulder, relying solely on that description would, one, frustrate Congress's purpose in enacting the NFA and the gun control Control Act, two, lead to absurd results, and three, permit manufacturers to circumvent the law by nominally describing the intended use one way, i.e. not as a short build rifle, and then designing and marketing the weapon as one, end quote. Again, that's from page 31 now of the document below. So the judge is really looking to say, this is less of an issue of how things are being marketed here. We're gonna be more looking at how they're being used within the plain meaning of the statute. Okay. I just want to mention here as well that anytime a lawyer is bringing any kind of motion or lawsuit or something like that, there's often two constraints on them. There's reality, there's many constraints, but there's two in particular. Sometimes according to either uh, court rules or maybe court local rules, there are constraints about how long they're allowed to write a brief for. So there's literally a page limit that they have to stick with them. Number two is the fact that candidly, a lot of judges don't really read everything that's put in front of them. At best, they'll skim, and I'm not suggesting that this is fair the way things ought to be. I'm just speaking from my own personal experience on the subject. So there's not only a hard cap, perhaps page or word limit, depending upon local rules, which may or may not exist depending on where you are and what kind of motion or issue you're engaged in at that point in time, but there's also the very real issue of how long can I write for the judge to actually be paying attention? And it appears that this judge did an excellent job of paying attention, Although it also appears that FPC was very limited, of course, on what they are allowed to raise. So they made a decision, a tactical decision, which I am 0% trying to Monday morning quarterback them on, where they decided to raise a lot of issues and they, rather than a couple issues well briefed, they, issue, they raised a lot of issues where they had less space to go into each and every single one of them. So a recurring theme that you're gonna see, and yes, we're about to get to a second amendment analysis next because FPC raised that as well. A recurring issue that you're gonna see is the judge has left the door open for the fact that look, as we get into this case, you may absolutely win on this, but just right now you haven't given me enough to get there. So again, that's gonna be a recurring issue and I'm not trying to, to throw bombs or, or throw shade or anything like that FPC. They made a tactical decision. Obviously, if they had gone the other way and then the judge did something else, people would just be Monday morning quartering back in the, the other way. So look, it is what it is. And then of course, the judge wraps off this whole first section when we're talking about the APA by also saying, look, the ATF has a well-established authority to interpret firearm-related statutes, provided that they do so within, of course, the meaning of the statute. Again, that's not me speaking, that's the judge speaking. Uh, and the judge went on to say, look, the plaintiff failed to establish how they overstepped the statute in their interpretation. The Second Amendment issue is the next thing we're getting up to next because the FPC also alleged that, look, this ruling by the ATF also oversteps and violates the Second Amendment itself. So the judge broke this down into a couple key parts. And you're going to be seeing analysis similar to this on almost every single major firearm case, or at least a lot of them, coming up in the years. So pay attention to this because if you want to be educated on this issue, this is it. One issue within this, the stabilizing braces are not bearable arms and thus the plaintiffs lack a second amendment right to use them. So we see this issue arise again and again and again when we're talking about so-called large or high capacity magazines, when we're talking about particular design features like pistol grips, when we're talking about scopes and maybe eventually red dots, slings, holsters, and so on. Because we've seen this exact sort of back and forth on what the second amendment is allowed to protect. Does it only apply to the firearms that themselves? Does it also apply to uh, some of these perhaps non-related firearm accessories, but accessories that may be instrumental to the use of the firearm? 
such as magazines and a semi-automatic weapon. So the analysis here that the court's going to go under actually comes directly from the 2008 case of DC versus Heller, where it says that the Second Amendment extends only to instruments that constitute bearable arms. So number two in the fact that the law does not trigger Second Amendment, does not cross or transgress the Second Amendment in this judge's view, deals with the fact that registrations under Title II of the National Firearms Act does not implicate the Second Amendment in this judge's view because, quote, the NFA's basic registration requirements do not implicate the right to bear arms, end quote. So the judge is saying that, look, just because something's organized under Title II does not mean that that somehow triggers a Second Amendment issue. Huh. If I'm a gun controller, seems like a nice way of trying to get around a lot of things in order to get gun control laws is we're just going to move everything under Title II of the NFA. Right. Expect that to be coming now. The court says that registration is okay and it's really not a big deal. It's not a big burden because it's similar to concealed carry licensing in many different states and the fact that in essence, people have been doing this for some time. Uh, again, not my views. That's what the judge is saying. Number three, the judge deals with the fact that, and this is going to be another big one, short bell rifles are dangerous and unusual weapons that do not implicate the Second Amendment. So let's remember that the NFA originally, by the way, let's just pause here to remember the fact that the National Firearms Act was all about banning and registering handguns until that was removed at the very last second thanks to some strong 2 a advocacy. Now, the reason why short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns were included was because basically that was kind of seen as falling in the shadow of, well, we're trying to ban handguns, we're trying to regulate handguns, and short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, those can also be easily concealed, so we're going to slide that in as well. But of course, then at the last minute, handguns were redacted, and we were left with this preposterous situation where handguns perfectly fine, but for some reason, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, not so fine, or at least subject to NFA registration requirements taxes, and of course, not uh, good in many different states to possess outright. So for brevity's sake, I'm not going to get into the whole lengthy analysis of what constitutes a dangerous or unusual weapon. If you want to see a separate video dedicated to that, let me know in the comment field below because I'd love to make one if enough people want it. But otherwise, trying to keep this video not on the super long side, so on we go. Suffice to say, the judge says, look, we're going to run this analysis and at the end of the day, SBRs, that's going to fall into being dangerous. Part of the argument for being unusual is interesting, and I am going to cover it, where the court actually goes into a percentages game and pulls up some interesting numbers. Now, I will note that the judge used the low end of the ATF estimate how many pistol braces are in circulation when he said that there are 3 million pistol braces that are out there. Then he added the approximately 641,000 registered short barrel rifles to come up with a total of 3.6 million possible devices assuming if there's 100% registration that we're basically we're talking about as being short bell rifles, again, in this judge's view. The judge then looked at the fact that there are approximately 400 million firearms in the United States and did some basic math to find out that SBRs constitute approximately 0.9% of the total amount of firearms that are out there. Therefore, this is reasonably low. I don't know why the court decided that 0.9% is reasonably low, but 0.9% in this judge's uh, view is unreasonably low, even though we're still talking about millions of weapons. And even though, of course, the judge is accepting the ultra low end math rather than the higher end math, which would put this closer to over 40 million and therefore closer to 10% of the weapons out there. Also alarmingly, the court also pegged the number of the combined AR-15s and Kalashnikov style rifles at approximately 8 million and also took another low-end estimate of the so-called large or high-capacity magazines of 50 million. I will note in a video I've got coming up that the number for Kalashnikov as well as AR-style rifles is probably closer to about 20 to even 24 million and could be much higher if we expand that across all sorts of other different categories, or at least somewhat higher, to include things like G3s, FN, FALs, AUGs, all that kind of stuff as well. I will also note that the NRA recently estimated the number of so-called high-capacity magazines to be at approximately closer to 250 million. And I will note that if there's approximately 20 million AR-15s and virtually every AR-15 is sold with two magazines that at least puts the math at 40 million. And last I checked, people tend to be buying extra magazines. So uh, I think that just a quick anecdotal logic test means that we are well, well, well over 50 million. But again, alarming that the judge is taking these low-end gun controller numbers as though they're gospel, at least right now in this case. 
So again, we actually have a video coming up where we go into the number of AR-15s and Kalashnikov style rifles. So it's a great reason if you're not a subscriber to consider subscribing so you don't miss that. Should be coming out probably in about the next week or so. Number four, and I know something most of you have been waiting for is of course the historical tradition test that was outlined in Brune. Recall that if a regulation or law is striking to regulate any kind of core Second Amendment protected activity, which we're definitely talking about if we're talking about rifles and pistols here, that it must fit within the nation's historic tradition of firearms regulation. So the government can meet that regulation hurdle by demonstrating that the regulation at hand is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms. Again, that's according to the Bruin decision. The government may do so by pointing to a well-established and representative historical analog. To be analogous, the historical modern firearms regulation must be relevantly similar, but it does not need to be a twin. It just basically needs to have a comparable burden here. This analysis can be nuanced, particularly in cases implicating dramatic technological changes, which to be fair, we've had a fair amount of over the last 200 years. So it's important to remember that the regulatory challenges posed by firearms today are not always the same as those that were preoccupying those concerns living back in 1791 or 1868. Again, not my words. If you don't like that, that's coming right from the U.S. Supreme Court for the most part. So there you go. And it's been accurately cited by the judge. Of course, it is interesting to note the judge threw out two particular timelines of 1791 and 1868 because, hey, that might be the difference oftentimes in a lot of these upcoming gun control battles of whether or not the pro two way or the gun controllers win, depending upon which error you want to draw from. Let me know if you want me to expand on that more in the comment field below. So the court then basically goes on in order to say the government meets its burden here of to recite a list of firearm laws that allowed for the colonies and early states to inspect firearms for safe condition, as well as to basically make sure that the firearms were proofed and uh, there was some testing protocols there, as well as some other laws that dealt with the taxation of the uh, imported gunpowder. I think that one came from New Hampshire, if memory serves. And eventually the issue ensues of licenses to possess firearms in the very late 1800s, pushing about 1890 or so. I think that came from South Carolina. If you want to know more about particularly the racist and awful history of gun control, check out our video. We have a massive series of that. Video one is debuted. We have many other videos coming where we explore how gun control has been used to oppressively exploit individuals, not just slaves and freed blacks in early America and the colonies, but also many other groups as well. Um, Europeans, Catholics, you name it. Let us know in the comment field if you want to see those videos progress. Otherwise, check out the link in the description box to video number one. So let's wrap this up. This has already gotten a little too long in my view, and I want to cover what went wrong and what are the next steps. Before I do, if you've not already done so, please consider clicking like, subscribe to the channel, make sure you don't miss any of our fantastic videos we've got coming up. And of course, share it around in order to help our humble channel grow. I already commented on the fact that FPC had to make a tactical decision of do we raise a few well-briefed issues or do we raise a lot of issues with less briefing? And I will note that the judge made a handful of comments and a handful of the rulings here. Keep in mind, I didn't cover the entire decision. Basically going into the fact that FPC, in essence, may have run out of ink in order to adequately plead their case. And that's 0% me attacking the FPC. I think they did a fantastic job. It's just simply the fact that the judge left the door open for the fact of, look, they may absolutely prevail with some more time on this, but for right now, they didn't. One of the immediate decisions is whether or not the FPC and the plaintiffs are gonna move for an appeal to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, because if they do, then, well, up we go. The Fifth Circuit, I will note, has also been favorable for 2A cases in the last about six months or so. So this might be a nice path to eventually get to the U.S. Supreme Court. But it's important to remember that any kind of appeal is only going to be appealing, if this happens, the preliminary injunction issue. It's not going to determine the entire case, except it might. And here's why. A lot of the issues of uh, interpretation and so forth are obviously going to be issues that are going to set the rule book and they're going to set the table for how this case may turn out. So if this winds up going up to the Fifth Circuit or even the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court or Fifth Circuit hand down some very favorable or very hostile interpretations saying this is the way you need to interpret this, this is the way you need to understand that, that may be dispositive about the case. In other words, that may basically end this case even though the case may still be going on. FPC may in essence be forced to give birth to a stillborn at that point. Or the exact opposite may happen where we may get some very favorable rulings and then it should only be a matter of time. But this is basically where it's gonna be going on from here. So best of luck to FPC. Please keep up the great fight. And again, let us know in the comment field below what you think about all this as always we will see in the next one. 
Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.